The reading this morning is John 17. I'm starting at verse 6 to 19, and I'm using the NIV. And this is Jesus speaking. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Now let's pray for Tim as he comes to speak to us. Holy Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus, through whom we can approach you now. Come Holy Spirit and bless Tim as he speaks to us. Give him wisdom. May his message change us, Lord, and make us more like you. Please, Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. And uh, yeah, we're just praying that God would be speaking to us and, uh, of course, speaking to our young adults as they um, uh, meet uh, uh, away at Carity Woods um, this weekend. Um, it's strange looking out, not seeing them. Um, there's, a, there's a famous saying that I've heard um, quite a few times over recent weeks about war, and, it, and it's this. It says um, this, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. I wonder if you've been hearing that too, as people have looked at the extraordinary things that are happening in Ukraine, uh, where there's such a need for our prayers, isn't there? And um, there's an opportunity to pray uh, this evening at the, at the level with other churches from around the city at six o'clock tonight. Um, but I've been, that phrase for some reason just been going around my head and I've realized that that phrase is true, not due just of war, but it's actually true of life, isn't it? You know, n- none of our kind of plans survive kind of first contact with life. You know, that, that phrase about wars is, is, is about the fact that nothing prepares you for the unpredictability and the, the challenges and the unforeseen things of war. It is true of life too. You know, our plans can be swept aside in an instant, can't they? Whether that's through illness or um, accident, whether that's unexpected redundancy. And that's especially true of parenting. Um, today is Mother's Day. You know, I've heard m- m- uh, the job of mother being described as the best, but one of the hardest of jobs. Not surprisingly, there are hundreds, 
thousands of books about how to be a mother, you know, how to make your child sleep and feed and play, how to prepare them um, for toddler groups and school, and the list is endless. You know, mothers have never had more information about how to be a mother, and yet still nothing really prepares you for first contact with your baby. I remember when we had our first child nearly... 18 years ago, the book of the moment was this book. It was the Contented Little Baby Book. This book was amazing. I mean, it promised predictable rhythms of sleep and feeding and play and rest for the parents. I mean, it just had, it was a manual to make a baby work. The problem we had was that our little baby hadn't read the book. So when we put our baby down on his back in the Moses basket for his sleep after being fed, our baby didn't just go to sleep for the next however many hours, Gina Ford had said. He just screamed, like screamed, screamed, screamed. It was a nightmare, absolute nightmare. This, 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 this book and this baby just didn't match because... We know every child is different. And we got to the point where we got kind of so stressed by this book. And I said to Laura, I said, look, I think I actually just need to throw this book away. And we did. We threw it away. We discovered no plan survives first contact with a baby you love, let alone an enemy. And that's exactly what Jesus' disciples are about to discover. Jesus warns them, verse 15, there is an enemy, the evil one, who, who wants to harm them. They need help. They need protection because their plans are not going to survive first contact with him. Even though they've just heard the greatest teaching there has ever been, the keys to a life of fruitfulness and joy and peace, they're going to discover that no amount of information, even from the lips of Jesus himself, prepares you for the reality of the battles of life and the battle with evil, despite all their self-assurance and even their promises of faithfulness, in a few hours, they're about to be scattered and devastated. They're going to feel completely lost. What's gone wrong? Maybe you've had an experience like this, a time where you felt like you're doing well with God. You know, you've got your devotions You're listening to the podcast. You're listening to extra sermons. I mean, you're just kind of doing well with the Lord. And then something happens that just kind of knocks you off your feet. Challenges come, and you're suddenly left floundering. I met with a mature Christian the other day who's going through a really difficult time, and they said to me, to be honest, it feels like God isn't even there. You know, my prayers just aren't being answered. How do we face those times when our plans are totally devastated and it looks like everything has gone wrong? Well, this is so important. You see, Jesus doesn't just give his disciples great teaching. What's he doing here? What's he doing? He's praying. He's praying for them, and this is so important. We've been in this series about going deeper with God, and yet there's some wonderful, amazing teaching we can receive on that. But ultimately, we can only truly go deeper with God and know more of God in our life is through prayer. We need prayer. Why does Je- what does Jesus pray? Well, he prays what every loving parent wants for their kids. He prays for their protection. You know, if if you want the best for your kids, you want the best for the church, if you want the best for your life and those around you, there is so much to learn from Jesus' prayer here. The two key things that Jesus prays that will protect his disciples in the face of the fiercest opposition and evil are here. The first thing he prays is that they would know the power of his name. You know, there's power in Jesus' name. Jesus 
keeps coming back to this theme. Have you noticed how often Jesus comes back? It's like, do you realize how much power there is in this name? There is, this is so much bigger and so much greater than they've realized. Verse 11, look, Jesus says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. And then he says, verse 12, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. What is he talking about? How does a, a name protect us? Well, well, this is all about who we belong to. You know, um, as a young teenager, I um, had to do work experience. Ever had to do work experience? Remember that? Those years ago. Um, and because my father um, worked for London Underground, I did my work experience uh, with him. And uh, he worked at quite a large depot and was uh, kind of a fairly senior manager there. And, um, but he'd go in earlier than me um, on, this, on this work experience. So I, I went in at normal school time. And I remember arriving at the depot gate, you know, and it's one of these places that you, children, you know, you just, you're never allowed in these sort of places, are you? But you always want to. You imagine being able to kind of go around all the trains, go into the depot, see everything. And so you arrive at this gate, you know, with the barbed wire and like the no entry signs, authorized personnel only. They say, what do you want? I say, well, I'm Mr. Velikot's son. And, And all of a sudden, I'm welcomed in. All of a sudden, I have access, and I find myself, you know, being able to walk beside the side of the tracks, being able to go in the front of train cabs, being able to go under trains uh, in the in the depot. It's just like amazing. Why? Well, it was nothing to do with me. It was all to do with the name of who I belong to. And what Jesus wants to do in this prayer is to remind his disciples who they belong to. And he wants that information to go kind of from their head to their heart so that they know that there's nothing that can change who they belong to. Look, verse 6, he says this, I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of, out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. The disciples were given to Jesus by the Father, because they belong to God. And this is so important. This is Jesus kind of getting to the heart of what a Christian is, because many people think that to be a Christian is to kind of admire Jesus and to want to follow his example and live a slightly better life. But that is not Christianity. Christianity is so much more than that. It's about a change of belonging. The Bible describes actually as being born again, getting a brand new life. And this is why Jesus makes this very clear distinction in verse 9, where he says, look at verse 9. He says, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, those who belong to me, for they are yours. There are two distinct groups here. There's the world, that's the world who reject God. And the only prayer that Jesus prays for the world is that they would be less worldly, that they would cease their rebellion. But for those who belong to him, his followers, he prays for their protection by the power of his name. What's his name? What's his name? Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Savior. God saves. Now, this might seem like a very basic question, but who does the saving in our relationship with God? Is it Jesus or is it you? Okay, it's Jesus, isn't it? But we like to think we've got a little bit to do with it, don't we? Yeah? I mean, that's what Peter thinks. Peter is laboring under the misapprehension that Jesus needs protecting by him. Yeah? He's about to get out his sword. Don't worry, Jesus. I'm there for you. You know, we can, we can live like that, can't we? I, I, I did really well for you this week, Jesus. Oh, I did that good thing for you. I, 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 and, oh, I'm, I really belong now. And Jesus, uh, Peter's about to discover that the only thing he has to offer when it comes to salvation is his utter failure. Complete failure. 
What does Jesus say the disciples have done towards their salvation? Look at verse 8. I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. All they do is accept and believe. You know, salvation is not something we achieve. It is something we receive. Jesus says this so clearly in John 6, 28, when asked, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. You know, to be a Christian is to give up on yourself and to trust what Jesus has done for us, what he's done in dying for the cross and forgiving our sins. That's how Jesus gets the glory of verse 10. They they give me glory because they trusted me. And all, all they've brought is their failure. All they've brought is their denials and their running away, but they've believed. And because of the power of the name of Jesus, that is enough. As the wonderful hymn to God be the glory says, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. That is good news, isn't it? Wonderful, amazing news. You know, one of the main strategies of the enemy is to take our focus away from what Christ has done and to put it on ourselves. And and what that results in is terrible because we either get full of pride when we think we're doing well and we look down on others, or we get devastated when we mess up. And Jesus wants to pray for his disciples that they will realize that their standing with God is not based on their performance, but is based on what Christ has done for them. That means that we, even when I'm in the darkest place, even when I feel abandoned, the truth is I'm still his child. It doesn't change anything. I'm still safe, just like nothing can change the fact that I'm my father's son. Nothing can change this truth. And this is such good news. And and Jesus knows we're going to struggle to believe it. And so he proves it in verse 12. He says, says, look, none have been lost. None have been lost except this one, this one who never really belonged to God in the first place. You know, if you belong to God and God knows who are his, he will never let you go. That doesn't mean we don't mess up doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean we don't even wander sometimes. But we are safe. Jesus says, John 10, 28. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. As the reformers wrote, it is by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone alone. Practically what that means is in life is that we are protected from despair when we mess up because it was never based on us anyway. And we're protected from pride. We can never look down on anyone because we are saved only because of what has been done for us. All we can do is trust in the name of Jesus. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. There is power in his name, power to keep you, power to keep those you love, and as we're going to see next week, power to unite people in the most beautiful, amazing way like the world has never seen. There's power in his name, but there's secondly, and finally, there's also power in his word. It's extraordinary what Jesus says here. He's about to go to the cross, about to face the darkest days he's ever seen. And yet Jesus prays. Look at verse 13 where he prays. He prays his disciples may have the full measure of my joy within them. What is this joy that Jesus has even in the face of death? Well, it's the joy of knowing that there is 
one plan that will survive not just first contact with the enemy, but every contact with the enemy. And it is this extraordinary word of God. We see that in his encounters with the enemy in the deserts. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The word of God stands forever. This is not like the contented little baby book. This is not just one person's opinion on how life should work. This is God who made everything the designer of all things telling us how life works and how our relationship with God is to work, how our relationship to one another are to work. This word is so powerful that even when people like Judas try to resist it, they end up fulfilling it. That's what he's praying in verse 12. God's word will always stand. Whatever comes against it, it will never go out of date because it's true. Just like gravity is true. It's true. Jesus describes it as like a seed, as we had illustrated earlier, that looks small. But when you you plant it in a person's life, it grows into the biggest and most beautiful of things. And so he says and prays, verse 14, I've given them your words. It's the greatest gift you can give someone, you know, that parents, if you're a parent here, sow this word into the life of your children. You know, if you're a person of influence, you're a teacher, if you've got someone who you are discipling or someone you're leading in a small group or a friend at work, one of the greatest gifts you can give them is sow this word into their lives. And yet here's the challenge the kind of paradox, that the very thing that Jesus gives his disciples to protect them is also the thing that invites trouble. Did you notice that? Verse 14, I've given them your word. It's like, great, this most powerful word. And the world has done what? Hated them. It's like, great, more trouble, Jesus. That's just what I needed. Why? Why would hatred come? Well, it comes because when when people live and proclaim the word of God, it reminds everyone that there is a God who made everything. There there, there is a designer, that there is a way to live, a way that we've been made for. And God's word reveals how far we are from that design and how much we have rejected God. You know, we see that design pattern in the environment. There was a program on recently about the problem of flooding and about how, um, you know, our cities get flooded, many of them, because years ago we thought it'd be great to take rivers that naturally meander, that's kind of curve, and straighten them. And so what happens is you get heavy rain, comes down off the hills and just like shoots down off the hills and fires into the cities and causes devastation. And so guess what they're doing at the moment all over our country? They're doing this. They're rebuilding the meanders of the rivers. They're putting the curves back in, allowing the wetland to develop again to slow the water down and stop the devastation. What are they doing? They're going back to God's original design in the first place. And you know, that is true not just of the environment. That is needed in every area of life. God says, I... I have the key here to human flourishing, whether that's in the area of of money or sexual purity or gender or relationships or work or parenting. You know, God's word tells us what the original design is, but the, the world says, well, I think I might know a better way. Why don't we just straighten this bit? not realizing that the consequences will be disastrous for those downstream. You know, the big challenge for the church is that we are called, verse 15, look at verse 15, we're called to be in the world. He says, I'm not taking them out of the world. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. Verse 16, they're not of the world. 
You know, the, the question is, will we blend into society or will we be the salt and the light that we have caught, been called to be? Will we be those who bring hope to the world? That's what Jesus is preparing his disciples to do, to bring something better, to bring something true. That is what Jesus is praying for when he prays, verse 17, that they will be sanctified by the truth. To be sanctified means simply to be set apart. You know, we have a special mission in this world. You know, to be ourselves transformed by the word of God and then to offer this word of life and hope and belonging to God, to our world. Are you making time to allow this word to shape you, to dwell in you, to transform you? Or, or, or do you do what's so tempting to do? Bits of it, ah, oh, why don't we just straighten that bit out? Oh, I don't like that bit. That surely be better. And people did that with the rivers because they thought it'd be better. They didn't realize. Why don't we just straighten this bit out? And that's a disaster. Because this word is the only thing that will stand contact with the enemy. Are you, are you holding on to the word? Holding on to its truth? Or maybe you want to and it just seems a bit difficult. It's a bit difficult sometimes, isn't it? How do we live this world? Well, Jesus tells us how we can be sanctified. He prays. Verse 19, for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Do you know, even our sanctification, that is our becoming more like Jesus, our set-apartness is dependent on who? Who? So, so even us becoming more like Jesus is dependent on Jesus. And again, that's so, we, we think, oh, well, surely that's the bit that depends on us, isn't it? And it's like, no, no, no. Even this depends on what Jesus has done for us on the cross. It depends on coming to him again for fresh mercy, coming to him again and saying, God, cleanse me, do what I cannot do in my own life. You know, the reality is we are in a spiritual battle. Evil is real. And we, there is no hope for us being and becoming all that God wants us to be in our own strength. This is what this series is about. It's about our vital connection to the vine. Us saying, God, I need you. I need you to change me and transform me. I need you to help me realize who I am in you, that I truly am a child of God who belongs to you. And Lord, come and shape me. Come and change me. You know, we have this amazing, powerful weapon in the Word of God that the Bible says can defeat the enemy. Sow it into your life. Sow into your children's life. Bury it deep and ask Jesus to work. Pray. And so, so what I'd love us to do now is rather than just get more information... Because I want us to pray. I want us to pray that that kind of information of, oh, I belong to God if I trust Jesus. And if you don't trust Jesus, it's an opportunity now. You can put your trust in Jesus. But if you do, let's pray that God takes what is kind of soft and head knowledge and breathe it into our hearts and our lives. That we would know that we're secure in him. And let's pray that he would be changing us, giving us the confidence we need in his word to trust and to follow. Let's pray together.